The key witness was released in produced and released in 1960 uh, by the great Phil Carlson, the director. And Phil Carlson, what you need to know about him is uh, Martin Scorsese said, when I want to understand how to direct action in a motion picture, I watch the movies of Phil Carlson. And this is really a kind of transitional movie between the kind of gritty noir of the 50s with uh, uh, the, the type of protagonist, a John Payne, two-fisted, tough guy, and now you're into 1960s, uh, the beginning of rock and roll, of hipster talk, of jive, and of juvenile delinquency. So I really think this film is kind of an interesting hybrid of two eras kind of coming into confluence, the 50s and the 60s, and it's, it, was, it was very contemporary for its time. The star uh, is uh, Jeffrey Hunter, and Jeffrey Hunter was part of that blast crop of stars along with Robert Wagner and so forth that came up through Fox and the studio system in the 1950s. Also features the one and only the late Dennis Hopper. Uh, and also starring is our special guest, uh, who I am thrilled to introduce. Uh, this is a lady that made her debut in Hollywood in 1953 with Martin and Lewis. Uh, she starred in the comedy Forever Female with Bill Holden and Ginger Rogers, appeared with Barbara Stanwyck, Fred McMurray, uh, Tony Curtis, and then really became a icon, or is it iconess, on television with Please Don't Eat the Daisies and just a whole plethora of credits. We are delighted to have her here tonight. Please welcome the lovely and talented Pat Crowley. Well, you know, I wasn't around when they did that incredible action business. <laughs> <laughs> I think Scorsese was right. Phil Carlson was quite a director. Oh, he was. He was. he was. he was. And you know, I worked with him before this film. He directed a pilot for a series that went on the air that was a two-hour pilot. And uh, so I had worked with him on that, and I found him to be the most intense, totally serious, involved director. And, and the series was The Untouchables. Oh, yeah. Well, you had, uh, you had Bruce Gordon as a district that's attorney, right. and he was uh, Frank Nitti in that's The Untouchables. Right. That's, that's right. That's right. That's right. But that was quite, and, and working with Stack and seeing um, uh, Phil pull out that performance from him, and he won the Emmy. For the, he won an Emmy for that. Really? So he, yeah, for yeah. The Untouchables. So what, uh, uh, what memories did you get from seeing Key Witness and seeing Jeffrey Hunter, who most of your scenes were with Jeff Hunter, and really uh, an underrated and often overlooked oh, actor because he yeah. died so young. Uh, yes. But we we played, last year we played A Kiss Before Dying that he oh, was in yeah. with R.J. Wagner. And uh, what what are your recollections of working with Jeff Hunter in this film? You know, I, I, I thought you might ask me that. And um, I, I somehow found him, him to be very serious too. And we really just did the, worked on the scenes together. I didn't right. know him mm -hmm. personally. Uh, I sure. knew his wife, Barbara Rush. Oh yes, wife. Barbara has been a guest here a couple Real, years ago. Oh, She's a delightful wonderful lady. Yes, but I really, I didn't get to 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 know him, mm -hmm. but to work with him at that, as that character and my character, right. it felt really right. You know, I felt like we could be yeah. uh, a couple with these two darling kids. And I had two kids about that age, maybe even younger at that time. And so I would go home at night and kind of hug wake your up kids. And hug them. <laughs> and, and I felt very, I, well, I really did get worked up doing that. I remember going home from MGM, driving late at night, um, right. 405 alone, you know, and, and I was so full of, of what was going on in, in, in the scenes that we did. And working with Phil, as I say. He just made you get really into the whole thing. So yeah. it was very, uh, so my my feelings about Jeffrey were really as the two, char the two characters. You were a couple, and, and it, yeah. it really was this kind of 
post-war uh, nuclear couple, the, the house in the suburbs, the two kids, the cat, the television set, and really that, that sense of paranoia, of, of impotence, where you know the, the kind of film war happenstance, uh, fate taps you on the shoulder, he goes and makes a phone call, witnesses the murder, then it all starts. And, and I think what, what Carlson was trying to do is that whole feeling of impotence that the police are incompetent and they're, they're really not up to it and uh, the, the price you have to pay for good citizenship. And then the whole juvenile delinquent type message, even though I think most of those people were like in their late 20s they and were, 30s. Yeah. I mean, they always, yeah, yeah. I, I always love really those movies where they have the Navy and they have Alan Hale, who's like 65 on a submarine or something. But uh, yeah, no one ever ages in the movies, folks. But um, I, I thought it was really timely. Last night we showed uh, Cry Danger, which was all shot at Bunker Hill in 51. <laughs> And here you see it about 10 years later, particularly the scene with the murder. And you could tell the neighborhood when uh, Frank Silvera says, well, how do you like East L.A.? Yeah. And, and you yeah. could see it, it was kind of a statement on all of that. But, well, and uh, the whole witness thing. I absolutely. Mean, people are terrified today. Absolutely. In, in, the, in any area, really. Absolutely. Step up and absolutely. Step up. So how long had it been since you seen the entire movie? I, was there a premiere? Do you remember oh, seeing no. it? Oh, yeah, no. Yeah. They didn't have premieres back then, <laughs> like they do now every yeah, other yeah, day. There's yeah, a premiere yeah. in Westwood. Yeah. But uh, no, um, there was no gathering of seeing it the first time. Right. And I don't really remember a lot of that action stuff. To, tonight yeah. was like, uh, gosh, it really kind of shook me up. I don't know about yeah. anybody else. And, and, it, it and really... the music, you know, you, you pointed that out. Wow, how. Yeah, the jazzy was that score jazz. and, and the, whole, the whole hip. Argot and the yeah. lexicon, and it, I think it was trying to capture that that whole era, and I think it did it uh, quite well. And, and really, you kind of don't take it totally seriously until the end when the the actor playing your son gets shot, and then all of a sudden you can hear this uh, very serious stuff, very dark yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. I thought all the the gang members were really well delineated. Oh, yeah. I thought they were. Uh, just fantastic. Oh yeah, Corey Allen. Corey and, Allen. And, and, Ooh, uh, that, what was he? Muggles. Yeah, that wow. Joby, Joby Baker, Muggles. I think, was uh, in it, and Johnny Nash's Apple, and it, it was, was quite an wonderful. ensemble. And what about um, the girl, Susan, Susan Harrison? Susan Harrison, who is still with us, and and. Uh, she was in uh, what Sweet Smell of Success That's with Burt right. Lancaster, and That's right. uh, she and certainly you know who, different she, part. <laughs> but isn't she the mother of the gal who won the Millionaire? Yes. What? Do you, I was so shocked. Yes, that's right. When, when it turned out that she was the mom. That's right. Of the gal that married the man on television. That's right. That's right. Did that's everybody right. know that? <laughs> yeah. Marvin did. Where's Marvin? Marvin, Marvin knows that. Know. Yes, Marvin yes, Cage yes. knows so, everything. Yeah. So, uh, your career, uh, I, in your bio, it says that you started as a 10-year-old in a play. Is that just a studio publicity thing, or did that really happen? Well, I, you know, my sister went to New York as a youngster and, and uh, with a $5,000. This is like a long <laughs> story, but no, no, no but she okay. went to New York to study singing. Mm -hmm. And from, we were from Pennsylvania, coal mining town. My right. dad worked in the coal mines. And she, my mom took my sister, and she then got into the chorus of Oklahoma. They called it the ensemble. And she was the understudy for, the, uh, for Lori, the leaning. So then eventually, and then she went on, and, and she brought my mom and, and uh, sister brought me to New York. And then I kind of tagged along and got some work. Right. So I was about 10, 10 or 11 when I started. Okay. And just kind of fell into things through my mm -hmm. sister, who just helped me right. so much. Everything she could do to help me, she did. Right. And so I kind of got really mm -hmm. lucky. And it's all luck and timing. Well, I think I think there's some talent and looks and all of that that goes with, don't you think so? Uh, I mean, come well, on. Was, I mean, it's it not was, all luck. It's not all luck. But, so, I believe, if, 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 if my uh, memory serves, you ended up on Broadway mm -hmm. before coming to Hollywood. Right, what was I the, did three Broadway plays. Right. 
in one year, so you can tell they were not very successful. <laughs> but I didn't know, I didn't care. I sure. was having the best, best time. I did all the live television you can think of, mm -hmm. including a show on Goodyear. Remember, well, you probably don't, you're way too young out here. But a Sunday night at 9 o'clock, uh, Philco Playhouse alternated with Goodyear Playhouse. And I did a Goodyear Playhouse. It was the best, best play opposite. There were three people in a three-character play. It was really, really uh, beautifully written. Tad Moselle directed it. Oh, and the director was great. I can't, oh, and Arthur Penn. Arthur Penn, Arthur yes, Penn. the late Arthur Penn, the late great Arthur Penn, right. Uh, on, and talk about another. Yeah, yeah. Great. well, intense, that whole intense. that whole generation of live television. You had Arthur Penn. Yeah. You had John Frankenheimer. You had uh, Sidney Lumet. Oh, that yeah. whole Danger, era, yeah. and and we just saw a movie with uh, Walter Matthau, who started mm. in live television. Oh, yeah. That was really live television. Was really like working without a net, wasn't it? Oh, totally. Uh, yeah. Everything, everything. You know, they, they, you just never stopped. I mean, you had to continue if right. someone dropped dead right there. You would just walk over the body <laughs> and just continue and say, but anyway, that three-character show, if you ever get a chance to catch it somehow, mm -hmm. at Goodyear Theater, it was Paul Newman and Faye Bainter. Oh my and God, what my, a cast. I mean, talk, that was really, a, and I saw it recently at the Paley, and it's absolutely fantastic. Tad Moselle wrote it, Arthur Penn, and it was produced by the top top people at NBC at that time. Right, that right. was that was that such must have a been a great experience. That for was you. a golden era.